Have you ever been stuck in a crowded elevator? Sometimes the emergency lights even go out. It's a little like being in a dark sardine can. If it's summer and there's no air conditioning, it's worse. How about the subway? You're riding along to your destination and suddenly your crowded train just stops. Worse is the smell of the train, the station and the wind constantly blowing the odor of a large city through the train car. And then there's the people. People you wouldn't likely associate with in your dreams, especially the ones who don't use deodorant. Now, imagine on top of all that, that half the people were tormenting you endlessly. Not just words, but punches, kicks and worse. Throw in the idea of being crowded into the cargo hold of a ship in the hot and unbelievably humid South Pacific with no water or food. Worse still, the ocean you're traveling over is absolutely teeming with submarines. Even those with the most vivid imaginations among us will only scratch the surface of the horror that were the hell ships of the Japanese in World War II. Welcome to a day in history. Thank you for watching. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States, the United Kingdom and Holland suffered setback after setback at the hands of the Japanese throughout the Western Pacific or the Eastern Pacific for those of you in Asia. The British possessions of Malaysia, Singapore and Hong Kong were overrun as were parts of New Guinea, the giant island north of Australia. The United States lost Guam, Wake Island and worst of all from the point of view of both prestige and power, the Philippines. The Free Dutch, whose nation had been conquered by Hitler in 1940, maintained control of their Indonesian colony, including the territory of Brunei two of the richest territories in the Pacific, mainly in oil and rubber after Hitler's takeover of Holland, but lost it to his allies, the Japanese, in the beginning of January 1942. At the time, Indonesia was known as the Dutch East Indies. Most of the prisoners the Japanese took during the war were taken in the early stages of the campaign in the Pacific. Prisoners taken later in the war as the Allies regrouped and took the offensive from mid-1942 onward were most often executed shortly after being captured, or questioned using torture and then killed later. One of the reasons so many prisoners were taken was because of the nature of the war. All of the territories the Allies defended, with the exception of those in Southeast Asia like Burma, were islands. With the defeat of the Allied fleets in the area, there was no hope of reinforcement or resupply for the soldiers and civilians of the Western powers. Mass surrenders occurred when all hope was lost. Hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers, sailors and airmen were taken prisoner, and hundreds of thousands more civilians became prisoners of the Japanese as well. That's just counting the Europeans and Americans the Japanese held. Throughout Asia, the Japanese forced hundreds of thousands of Filipinos, Burmese, Vietnamese, Malayans, Singaporeans and Indonesians into slavery for the many projects they were attempting to build in order to strengthen their defensive and transportation networks. There are some excellent movies about the experience of those taken prisoner by the Japanese in World War II. Empire of the Sun, Paradise Road, The Great Raid, Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence, and the most famous of them all, The Bridge on the River Kwai. By the way, Paradise Road is probably the most accurate, with Empire of the Sun and The Great Raid a close second. The Bridge on the River Kwai is a great movie, but while they were alive, the men who survived the ordeals of the Burma Railroad made sure they let the world know that they hated it. If we tell you why, it'll be a spoiler, so we won't. But there are parts of the film that hit the nail on the head, and that's all about the incredible suffering endured by all of the men taken by the Japanese. 
The worst part is, most of the misery was not because of the heat or the bugs, poisonous snakes or even the disease. It was because on top of all of this, many Japanese officers and guards tormented their prisoners almost without end. Some books and first-hand accounts will tell of kind Japanese guards, or perhaps less mean is a better way to phrase it. But sadly, on the whole, most accounts are full of physical and psychological torture, disregard, starvation, beatings and executions. Of them all, by far the best known of the experiences of the Allied POWs was the Bataan Death March. This event was the largest and most publicized of its kind, but similar events occurred in British and Dutch held territories. We should also mention that tens of thousands of soldiers of the UK fighting in Asia were from Australia along with some from New Zealand. A Day in History is gonna do a video on the Death March and it's a long horrible tale. But for now, let's just say that the Japanese captured about 75,000 American and Filipino soldiers and marched them 60 miles in the burning humid heat to ramshackle prison camps near Cabana Chung. On the way, Japanese guards shot, stabbed and beat to death men who dared to drink out of streams and wells. Those who fell down from sickness, weakness or injury, those who tried to escape and anyone they deemed was disrespectful. Some of the men who got it worst were larger, taller Americans. The Japanese wanted to make a point to the thousands of Filipinos and Filipinas who were watching, just how strong they were and just how weak the big Americans really were. It's important to remember that many of those watching, especially the more plentiful women, saved many of those on the march by sneaking them fruit or water. They did this at risk of torture and death. Thousands of POWs never made it to the prison camps. Those who did were in for a completely different kind of hell. From 1942 through the first half of 1945, the Japanese actively moved POWs around to where they were needed. That could be to Japan, to China or to some other island nearby or far away. Some lucky few stayed behind at the first camp they were sent to, but many of those men were not so lucky after all. Starvation and disease claimed many of them. Some of the men who were put aboard the many Japanese freighters and trawlers thought that perhaps where they were going was going to be better than where they'd been, and so somewhat eagerly got on the ships. Sometimes they were right, and the ships did take them to an easier place, though being held by the Japanese anywhere in World War II was always an ordeal. Many of those taken to Japan found themselves with easier duty, or with less or slightly less harsh supervision. Unfortunately, most did not, and many of the men who hoped for some relief from what they had just experienced never made it off of the Japanese ships. The ships the Japanese used to transport prisoners were unmarked as POW ships. By all the recognized rules of war, which Japan had agreed upon many years before, any ship carrying POWs was supposed to be clearly marked on the hull and decking, so it could be seen by enemy ships and planes. None of what became known as the Hell Ships was marked in any way, and looked just like any other Japanese merchant ship, except in some cases they had more deck guns than a normal freighter would carry. Many of the Hell Ships made it to their destination with their human cargo. Some ships made two, three, five, ten trips before being sunk. Though many of the POWs on the Hell Ships survived their voyage and perhaps even the war, the experience of those on the vessels were much the same. There is a reason why they're called Hell Ships, and in a few moments, we're going to tell you about a survivor's account that will horrify you. But before we get to that horror, we're going to tell you about another one. 14 of the Hell Ships were sunk, taking an estimated total of 20,000 Allied POWs with them to the bottom of the ocean. Worse still, the ships were sunk by their own side. Why? 
because the Japanese did not display the proper markings, you know, like writing POW in 10 foot high white letters on the sides and decks. Added to this, many of the Japanese radio communications were being intercepted. And in many cases, the Allies knew the ships were leaving, going and were located. They also knew what their cargoes were or were not. The Japanese never talked about prisoners, and if they did, they used euphemisms that made their human cargo sound like boxes of rubber, machine parts, etc. In May 1942, the Japanese began shipping their prisoners over the ocean. By late 1943, and certainly into 1944, the Allies, and particularly the American submarine fleet, were running amok in the Pacific, sinking thousands of tons of Japanese shipping per month, mostly cargo vessels. Cargo vessels that looked like any other cargo vessels. By early 1944, Allied warplanes were dominating the skies as well, and were sinking almost as many ships as the Navy. To help you imagine, by the end of the war, the Japanese were desperate for food, and were shipping it from nearby Korea and China in sampans, the familiar wooden sailing ships of Asia. American submariners blew many of these out of the water. The sardine can analogy we used in the intro was apt, except sardines are dead. When the men went aboard the hell ships, most of them were put into various cargo holds. Empty areas of the ship like this vary inside of the bow and on deck. Ships designed to hold less than 50 people were made to hold 1, 2, or 3,000. Some cargo holds were divided into two, horizontally. Two floors of bunks projected from the structure, and men on the deck below. On some of the hell ships, the men were packed in so tightly standing up that they could not move. Many could not even turn around. Add to that the unreal heat of a metal container with very little airflow. What fresh air did come in, came in through the hatches of the cargo holds when they were opened. Those on deck had air, but they had no protection against the sun and the rain, and on deck too, it was crowded. They had to endure constant observation and beatings from the guards. The Japanese mounted machine guns on the superstructure, another high points overlooking the deck, but they did not need to guard the men in the hold, there was no way out. On less crowded ships, which would be overcrowded by any stretch of the imagination, some men tried to build human ladders or use ropes they found. Anyone trying to escape was shot, used for bayonet practice, or was beheaded by an officer's samurai sword on deck for everyone to see. Misbehavior on the part of the prisoners was often met with death. If a man in the hold would not come up if and when ordered to, it was more than likely the rest of the prisoners would die from gunfire aimed straight down at them and aimed randomly. There was no place to go to the bathroom. For the men who had room, a space away from the others would be used by everyone. For those who didn't have room, well, the men just soiled themselves as they stood. Within a short time in conditions like these, some men went mad. Men on deck would just decide to jump off in the middle of the ocean. On the ship Maros Maru, Maru means vessel in Japanese, 159 men died in the hold in the 40 days the ship waited to be repaired at a port in Makasa, a port in the Dutch East Indies. These men were British and Dutch. Their bodies were just chucked over the side into the harbor for the sharks that gathered there. There is no worst hell ship, they were all horrible, but the description of just a little of what happened on the Oriokumaru will give you a better idea of what the nightmare of the hell ships was like. From an account in John Tolland's best-selling book, The Rising Sun, The Rise and Fall of the Japanese Empire, many men lost their minds and crawled about in the absolute darkness armed with knives that had been smuggled in from camp attempting to kill people in order to drink their blood or armed with canteens filled with urine and swinging them in the dark. 
the hold was so crowded and everyone so interlocked with one another that the only movement possible was over the heads and bodies of others. The Oriokumaru was attacked by aircraft from the USS Hornet intermittently from December 13th to 15th and was sunk in Subic Bay, Philippines. 270 people died in the attack, the majority of them US prisoners, though there were many Japanese civilians in crew cabins. On the Janyomaru, 4,200 Asian laborers and 2,300 POWs were crammed into the holds and were being transported from one place in the vast Indonesian archipelago to another when the British submarine HMS Tradewind slammed two torpedoes into her. Over 5,500 of the prisoners went down with the ship. 674 POWs were rescued by the Japanese. Of those, eight died en route to the hospital. The men on the Janyumaru who were rescued were fortunate. In many of the hell ship sinkings, rescuing Japanese ships or crewmen about, lifeboats opened fire and killed survivors bobbing in the sea. In at least one case, that of the US submarine Wahoo, POWs were killed by fire from deck guns of Allied ships. In the case of the Wahoo, the men in the lifeboats and in the sea were mostly Indian, and in the smoke and confusion of battle, the men aboard the Wahoo mistook them for Japanese sailors, who often waited for rescuing Allied ships to come close before they opened fire on them or blew themselves up. Many of the officers and men who were on the ships that mistakenly sunk Japanese boats filled with prisoners suffered from PTSD for the rest of their lives. Many, upon rescuing their own men at sea, begged their forgiveness on hands and knees, repeatedly crying, we didn't know, we didn't know. Hell ships, literal hell.